This is ringing quite a, quite a bit. Good morning. Good morning, family. Good morning, everyone. So excited to be here with you guys this morning. So excited to get up and worship with you guys and just to have that freedom and that opportunity to do, do so. Um, we're going to be continuing our series in the book of Malachi. Um, Dusty did a wonderful job last week of just kind of opening up this, that second half of, of chapter one, talking about the priest, talking about um, the, the dishonor and kind of the disrespect that they were showing God and the offerings that they were pre- presenting. And you remember when we started the, the series two weeks ago, um, for all of you guys who were here, that I wanted to encourage you, and I want to continue to encourage you to, as we go through the book of Malachi, the book of Malachi very much is a heart check for us. Um, there's, not, there's not a whole lot that happens in Malachi that is uh, super positive and very... And, uh, and, it is encouraging if you're looking at it through God's eyes and when we see what God is doing, but it is, very <clears throat> it is very much a heart check for us to look at how are we living and how, how do we compare to, to these disputations, to these charges that the Lord is bringing against the priests and, and the people of Israel at this time. And so, again, I want to encourage you, again, like Dusty was t- talking about last week, where, you know, the, the kind of the key to that was is, the offerings that were being brought, they weren't, the be- they weren't their best. And, and last week, as Dusty was teaching, it, 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 I was doing a heart check for myself and asking the Lord, Lord, do I bring you my best all the time? Or do I cut the corners? Or do I, do I kind of s- skirt around it at times? You know, do I, do, Lord, do I give you my best in everything I do? When I come to church on Sundays, am I giving you my best? When I do my work, am I giving you my best? Am I giving my best to you as I, as I minister to my wife and as I minister to my kids? Am I giving you my best in everything? And so again, it's that heart check that, that, that as we continue to go through the book of Malachi that I want us to do. And so today we got, we got quite a bit to go through, so I'm going to try to get through it as fast as I can. I make no guarantees. It could be, you know, we could be here for a couple hours, so get comfortable. Um, but we're going to kind of finish off. So our text today, we're going through chapter two of Malachi, and it's kind of broken up into two parts that kind of seem like they are not tied together. So what, the first part, again, if you remember that when we talked about a couple of weeks ago, is we talked about the, these, these, these charges that, that, the, that the Lord brings again. It kind of goes in this fourfold pattern. The Lord brings a charge. The people respond and they ask a question. How are we doing that? Then the Lord answers the question, and then he applies the answer. He gives application to it. And so what we're going to see in this, this, first, this first half of chapter 2 is we're going to see kind of God's answer and, and, and how he applies um, to what we, what we learned last week with, with the priests providing kind of that impure and that kind of disrespectful offering and just kind of the lax and the laziness that they, that they allowed and that they got into. And we're going to go into that, and then the second half of it is we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects is we're going to talk about marriage and the importance of marriage in, in Scripture and that. But what I, and again, they seem so separate. We're talking about the priests and offering, and then we're talking about marriage. And what I want us to understand, and before we get into the text first, is I want, us, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about covenant. Because I think if we really understand what a covenant is and how God sees the covenant, it helps us to really unpack the scripture. In the scripture as a whole, whenever we read through the Bible, if we really understand how God works and how God sees a covenant and, and how God works through a covenant, it helps us to really unpack scripture. But even spe- specifically here, we can kind of see a lot of, a lot of God's covenant and covenant language and, and why he gets so upset and why he gets so um, disrespected by, by a lot of the things that the priests and the people are doing. And so one of the things, so when we talk about a covenant, a covenant um, for all intents and purposes is, is kind of like a contract. And if you, I, I've, I'm self-employed, and so I've been in several contracts myself. Um, and, you know, there, there's two different kind of ways that you can look at a contract. You can look at a contract as a very binding agreement. It, it's, it's, it's there to, you know, protect both parties and, pro- and protect this. Uh, a lot of people also look at contracts as just 
something to try to get around, something to try to, to get out of, something to kind of, you know, it, it helps protect them. How can they use it for their benefit? And so what we see in, in Scripture is that God, throughout all of Scripture, God uses the word covenant, and he uses covenants to, um, to move. And all of Scripture is, is, is about God fulfilling his covenant. And what we see is that God is a covenant-making, covenant-fulfilling God. He holds the covenant. He keeps the covenant. He, he, he maintains the covenant. And the covenants and the contracts that you and I experience, and, and a lot of us, have, again, we've had, we might have had some poor experiences. I would even say the, the reason we're even in this building right here today is because of a bad business relationship contract that I had with somebody that kind of led down the road to us having this place and being in this place right when COVID, right when COVID started. God worked that out. But we kind of see that what tends to happen, and, the, and most of the contracts and, uh, that, w- that you and I experience, they're, they're bilateral contracts. They're, it's an agreement between you, me and someone else, or you and someone else, and, and both parties bring the means of the covenant. They, they set the stipulations, they set the, 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 the standards for it, and, and the regulations and the boundaries for it, and they both maintain it, and they both uphold it. And, and again, it's man upholding it. And this is why we have a lot of times where people break contracts and it causes a lot of problems. We, and we kind of see this in, in marriages where we have prenuptial agreements and things like that where those things hardly hold up in court and they're always getting broken and they're always getting, they don't hold the weight that they used to hold. But the significance and the importance is with God though. Those agreements, this covenant is a, it's a unilateral covenant. It means that we don't really bring anything to it. God sets the standard. God sets the, the, the terms. God sets the blessings for it, the cursings for it. The only thing that we do is we decide if we're going to accept it or not. And we see this in, in, in throughout Scripture. We see it through the Abrahamic covenant. We see it in the Mosaic covenant. We see it in the new covenant that is the, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We see that Christ died for our sins. Again, we have nothing to do for it. We did nothing to earn it. We did nothing to deserve it. But Christ himself, God himself, came to earth, died for our sins, paid the debt price that we could not pay. And all that is asked is that if we accept it. And if we do accept it, then we put ourselves underneath God's covenant, which means we put ourselves underneath God's command, underneath God. Our life is no longer our own. Because, again, God sets the stipulations. We can't come and say, well, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to accept your, you know, your payment for my sin debt that I can't pay, but you know, I still want to go out and you know, I don't, I don't want to get married. I just want to sleep around and I want to do all this, but I want to be okay. We can't, we can't come to God and say, well, I want to obey all these rules and I, and I want to obey this command and I want to obey this part of the covenant, but then I want to disobey this part. I want this part to benefit me and, and, and this part not to benefit me. It's we come to God and God sets the standards and we either accept it or we reject it. And, that, and, and when we understand this and as we read through Malachi you, and as we read through these verses, you're going to kind of see God's covenant at work and you're going to see again why God comes so strange because he uses a lot of very strong language in, in, in these two in these. In chapter two, some very strong, very some very strong language. Some things that that for some people here and, and some people listening, it might hurt, and it might be hard to hear. But it's still God's truth, and we still need to come to it again with that submission, that submissive heart, saying, "God, you are God. What you say matters, not what I want, not what I feel, but what you say matters." And so. As we're going to start reading right now, um, starting in verse, starting verse one, chapter two, I want to pray real quick. Father, Lord, I just thank you so much, God, for just who you are, Lord. I thank you, God, Lord, that you've given us a voice, Father. You've given us an opportunity to lift our hands and worship you, Father, to honor you, God, through our lives, Lord, to praise your name, Lord, to 
glorify you, Father, and just to lift your name up, Lord. I pray, Father, Lord, in this place, God, that your truth would be spoken, Lord, that your name, Father, would be glorified. I pray, Father, right now, Lord, that as we open your holy scriptures, Father, we read your word, Lord, that it would penetrate our hearts, God, and that we would come to it, Father, not with a hard heart, Father, not with a, a desire to, to stand on whatever we feel, Father, but that we would come, Father, on our knees, submissive to who you are, God, to understand, Father, and to get an understanding of the, your character and, and who you are and how, how you serve and how, and how you call us to serve you, Lord. I pray right now, Lord, that, that you would just use me, Father, to speak your word, that you would use me, Father, to be your, your vessel, Lord, and that everything that comes out of my mouth, Father, would be you, Lord. And so we love you, we praise you, we give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor in your precious name, amen. And one other thing that I, I want to say in regards to the covenant and what makes it so different is like any contract, it's, it's an agreement, right? I'm saying I'm going to do this. You're saying you're going to do that. But with a covenant, a godly covenant, it is, the main difference is it is God saying he's going to accomplish this thing. And if we know anything about God and his character, we know that he is faithful. He is committed. His, if he spoke a word, and, and gave his word that he, uh, and gave a promise, we know that it's not going to return void. And all throughout all of Scripture, what we see is that God, after making his covenant with Abraham and making his covenant with, with Moses and with David, through all of history, through all of, of Israel's history, what we see is this, this constant uh, God continuing to work his covenant out, even though the people of Israel are constantly breaking the covenant. God does not go back on his word. Jesus said in Matthew 25, though heaven and earth may pass away, my word, my words will not pass away. Not just the words he spoke, but the word that he gave. His promises, it will not pass away. And so that, and so these, the, the covenant in, in the mind of God is a, it's a forever thing. It's not lightly, it's not something that is said lightly. It's not like us when, you know, like, if you were, when you're a kid or maybe when you're older, you're like, you know, God, if you, if you help me here, I'll promise I'll, I'll, I'll do this. And I'll, I promise I'll, I'll never smoke again or I'll never drink again or I'll never look at a woman that way again if, I, if, if you just help me out with this. And we make these kind of promises and they're kind of empty promises that we really cannot keep a lot of the times. And the difference is, is when God says he's going to do something, when God told Abraham I'm going to make you the father of many nations. It took time. And even Abraham and Sarah, they tried to take God's plan into their own hands by, with Ishmael and, and, and Haggai. But God still, despite that, moved his covenant forward. He never gave up. He never gives up on us. And so that, again, I want us to keep that in mind, that, it, that with God... A covenant is an unbreakable thing. He said he's going to do it, and it will be done. So in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And now, O priest, I'm, so I'm going to read through all of this, and we're going to go back through it. So verses 1 through 9. It says, And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. And typically, I, we, I teach out of the ESV version, but today we're going to read the New King James Version just because... I feel it gives a lot, a good sense of the heart of what God is trying to communicate here. And so again, it says, And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on their faces, the refuse of your solemn, of your solemn feasts, and one and and one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, 
that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him, one of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me, and he was reverent before my name. The law, of, the law of truth was in his mouth, and, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity, and turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek law from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from my way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore... I also, have, I also have made you contemptible and base before all the people. Because you have not kept my ways, but you have shown partiality in the law, treachery of in, uh, in the law. Okay, so let's go back through this. Starting in verse one, verse 1 and 2, it says, And now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear and if you will not take it to heart, to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts. And I want to stop right there. And again, so we see the priests here. And, and this is the accusation against them. This is, this is the, that they're just, they're disrespecting and, dis, and, and they're indifferent to God. They're not honoring him. And they're not taking him seriously. And I think this is a question that we all have to kind of ask ourselves at some point. Is God, do I take you to heart? Are you real? Because the truth of the matter is, is that it's either all real or none of it's real. And so often I see, we, and, and, and in my life I've, I've been there, where we, we sometimes treat God as if he's there and we know he's there and we know he's loving and we know he's forgiving, but we don't always take him seriously. We don't always open up his word and take every word of it as, as seriously. It's so common today, and, and, and again, I see videos of, of, of people where they take God's word and they, they take it out of context and they, and they pervert it and they twist it to mean what, what they want it to mean. But again, we all have to come to a point where we ask ourselves and we have to decide for ourselves. It's either all true or none of it's true. I can't open up my Bible and read a certain section of Scripture and say, okay, well, I believe that, and then turn the page to another section of Scripture and say, well, I don't think that's true. And the fact of it is, is that if we believe it's true, if we accept all of it, then we have to live it out. Each and every day. This was the charge against the priest. They weren't living it out anymore. It was the priest's job to know the law. It was the priest's job to not just know it, to, but, but to minister it to the people. When the, when the people came to give their sin offerings, it was the priest's job to make sure that it was a pure sin offering, to make sure that there was no blemish, that it was something that was worthy of being offered before God. And they weren't doing that. They weren't taking him serious. And sometimes I, I struggle at times, again, I struggle at times always with when, when I watch, when I see videos and I think, see things on TV of just people not taking God serious. And a lot of times it's not even just, it's not even unbelievers. Because I don't expect unbelievers to take God seriously. They don't believe. But what hurts me often is when I see Believers taking, not taking God seriously. Where we can go, it's all about what can God do for me? How can God bless me? How can God help me? Everything is about me, me, me. When, re and when reality is, it's about him. I live to serve him. I work to serve him, to glorify him. I raise my kids so that they can know and glorify him. Loving my wife is, is a way of honoring him. My wife loving me is a way of honoring him because I'm going to tell you, I'm not always 
worthy of honor. I'm not always worthy of, of how she serves and how she blesses me. She absolutely is worthy of, of, of all the love and care that I can give her. But I'm not always worthy of it, yet she does it anyways, and that's a way of glorifying God. It's on us to take God seriously, to not become like these priests. When we come here to worship and we come here and we lift our hands and we, and we sing praises to his name, that's an, act of, that's an offering of worship to the Lord. And how can we come, and, you, and we'll see here in just a little bit that this was part of the charge that, that the Lord had against the priests is they were doing these things and they were living this right, but they, they would come and they would try to give their offerings. They would try to go through their, their religious duties and give their offering to God. And God's like, God's telling them, it's a worthless offering. When we come into this place and we lift up our hands or we bow our heads in prayer, it's an offering to the Lord of worship. But how can we come in here and raise our hands and raise our voices and worship him if we don't take him seriously. And, and we're just doing it just because it's what we think we should do. It's, it's what we think that we have to do. We do it out of obligation. God doesn't, God cares less about the act of the offering and the act of the act of the religious piety than the actual obedience and the heart behind it. It's our hearts that he's after, and our hearts have to take him seriously. And so that's, a, again, this is a heart check question. Do we take him seriously? Or do we just take him seriously on Sundays? Or do we just take him seriously when, when everything's going to hell and we don't know what to do? When life is in, when life is, going haywire and, and, and I need help? Is, am I only taking God seriously then? Or do I take him seriously every day of my life? It says, if you will not take it, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. And that's such a powerful phrase right there because we see the result of when we don't take God seriously. We see the result in the lives of the priests. They, when they... They're not taking God seriously. And so what does, he, what, what does he do? The blessings that they received, that they experienced, that they enjoyed under, the cov under God's covenant are removed and are, they're cursed. The blessings that we experience under, living under God, the priests, it's everything that they thought that they had, the power of the prestige, it's, it's going to be ripped away from them because they didn't take God seriously. And he says, yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. And my prayer would be that, that I would never get to a point that God could say that to me. That his blessings and his hand upon my life is, is, is being removed or being lessened because I don't take him seriously because I don't give him my all. I don't give him my best each and every day. Verse 3 says, Behold, I, re I will rebuke your descendants. And it's not only... I think that's sometimes something that we often, that we often especially as the parents here, uh, sometimes we often think we kind of just live to ourselves, but he says... It's not only the, this rebuke and this, this curse that, that the priests are experiencing. It's not just on them, but it's going down to their kids. He re says, I will rebuke your descendants. Our kids watch and know who we are, and it affects them. It affects who they are. God's hand on their life, how I live, how I, how I raise Josiah, my son Josiah, the man that I am in front of my son Josiah. It's not, I don't just live, again, we don't, I just don't live for me. I live for God, but I also live for my, so that I can be an example to my family. So that as, when my son grows up, he has, 
He knows what a godly man should look like. Not a perfect man because he probably wouldn't say it because he'd be scared that I'm going to give him a hard time about it, but he knows I'm not perfect. He knows that I, I'm fallen, but he also knows that I love Jesus. He knows that, I, that as much as I can, I give everything I can to Jesus. And that's the legacy that, that all of us, especially as parents, should have. That should be the concern is not just, I can't, do I live and do I honor God, but, but what kind of example am I giving my, my children? Because I don't want to lead them in a way where God is cursing them and rebuking them. And he says, and spread refuse on their faces, the refuse of, of your solemn feast, and one, and one will take you away with it. And so refuse here in the ESV, it says dung. So it's poop. And, and so what was happening here is that when, when people were bringing their offerings to, to, to the priest to be offered, what would, ha- what would happen is that they would, in order for it to be a pure offering, in order, to, in order for it to be a correct offering, they would need to take the intestines and, and, and the inside, especially the parts that, where it did hold the dung, and they would take it outside of the temple and they would burn it. But what was happening is that because they were bringing these impure offerings, they weren't doing that. And so God says here, he says, and spread refuse on. Basically, he's, if, if you've had a dog, you know kind of one of, the, one of the, the training techniques and one of the things that you do with the dog when the dog pees and poops in the house is what? You rub their nose in it, right? And that's, and that's, Essentially, what God, is, what God is saying here to the priest right now is you disrespect me so much. You bring this into my house to try to give it as an offering to me. It's so disrespectful and so dishonoring that I'm going to take that, that, that offering that you think that you're honoring me with and I'm going to rub it your faces in it. Because it is, it is not right. And that's a... We had a... We had a, Jamie and Romeo's... We, we bird sat this past week. And so, you know, Josiah, who is... If you know Josiah, he's a... He's like a by-the-book, you know, like... Any rule you guys wrote down, he was, like, trying to, to, but when it came to, like, you know, like, came to picking up the bird and, you know, he's putting a, a thing on his arm because he doesn't want the bird to touch him, but he does, but he loves animals, but then he's, like, the bird poops and he's got to clean it up and he's, you know, he's gagging and it's bird poop, okay? Like, it's, it's the smallest little thing, right? It's not, it's. And he wants a dog, and so we're like, okay, well, you know. But this is, so he's, I think about him freaking out over this little, little piece of bird poop, and here God is telling the priest, you're going to take the dung of a sheep or a goat or whatever, and they're going to rub it in your face because you're dishonoring me, because you're disrespecting me. And that's a, that's a powerful statement. And it should be, again, a heart-checking ch- heart statement. In verse 4, it says, Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. And what I love about this and what, and what you see here is you see that the Lord, again, he's faithful. He doesn't give up. He's going to fulfill his covenant. He loves us. He loves his people. He's going to go through whatever measure it takes. It's not, he has every opportunity to say, you know what? It's just too much, guys. We're done. But he doesn't. He shows discipline, but yet the discipline is always in order to bring the people back to him. To restore the heart and to restore the people. And so we see that in these these next, next few verses. 
Verse 5 says, my covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. And when we see the verbiage of that, he said, I gave them to me. I gave, my covenant with him was one of life and peace. And it says, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. Can I tell you that the fear of the Lord is a, is a blessing for us? I think back to the days before I knew Christ. I didn't fear God. But as soon as I gave my life to him, and I really understood about who he was. There was a, that honor and that respect that, that, that sprung to life in me. Because I knew the power of who he was, the magnificence of who he was, how strong and how mighty he was. And, that, and the fear is not a scared fear, but it's a respectful fear, an honoring fear. And that fear, again, should cause us to want to live for him to want to serve him, to want to, to want to obey his covenant and obey his commands. We so often talk about the love of the Lord. God loves us, how much he loves us, how much he cares about us, how much he wants good for us, which is all great and all good. But we should also be talking and, and, and looking and, and studying on, on the fear of the Lord because he is great, he is powerful. He holds the whole world in his hand. None of this exists without him. Life isn't here without him. If he was to somehow just let go, everything would fall apart because he holds it all together. He is the center. He is the foundation. That's where the fear of the Lord should start, begin, and end. And it says in verse 6, it says, so and he's talking about the priests, and he's, and, and he's going to give a couple of kind of a description of what the priests and kind of should look like. And he says, the law of truth should be in his mouth, so he should know the law. And the justice was not found on his lips, so he speaks truth all the time. He does the right thing. He walks in integrity. He walked with me in peace and, and equity, that he walks with the Lord each and every day, one of life and peace, as he said, that that was the covenant with with Levi, that he walks with him in peace and equity, that every day, each and every day, he walks with the Lord, and, that, and not just that he walks, but people know that he walks with the Lord. That should be evident in his life. And he turns many away from iniquity, that he stands for God's justice, he stands for God's word, and his life in speaking and in his, what his life represents, is it represent, and it shows people how they should live. Not because he's so good, but because God is so good. And it says, for the lips of the priest should keep knowledge. He should be knowledgeable. He should have wisdom. And people should seek the law from his mouth, that he should be able to give good counsel and good wisdom. Should be some, this person should be someone that you can go to when you're in, having trouble, when you're confused, when you don't know what to do, when, when things are going haywire and you need a word and you're freaking out. It should be so, he should be someone that you can kind of go to. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. And I think that's an important thing for, for him to, and for, for, and for us to understand. It's talking about the priest, but each and every one of us, I, I believe, we're ministers in some way or another. You might not be up here on stage teaching, teaching in front of a church, but you're a minister, and if you're a man or a husband, you're a minister in your household. As a woman and as a wife, you're a minister in your household, to your, to your husband, to your wife, to your kids. You're a minister and, and you're, you're when you go to work with, with your coworkers. You might be, again, as we've said here before, you might be the only Bible that, that somebody ever reads. So when we look at this, it's easy to look like, well, that's what the pastor should be. But this is what we should all be. We should all be this. We should all have the knowledge, have the wisdom, be someone that people can come to, be someone that speaks the truth, be someone that reflects who Christ is in everything we say and what we do. And in verse 8 and 9, it kind of just goes back to, again, that application 
It says, but you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. Which Jesus said it, was, it would be better that you're not even born than to cause your brother to stumble. To, that's, that's a grievous sin right there. That, that, you could, that you were to lead someone away. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord. Therefore, I also made you contemptible and base. So he's giving his judgment before all the people because you have not kept my ways. He's telling them, I'm going to get rid of you. Because of this, because you refuse to repent, because you refuse to change your ways, because you refuse to honor me, I'm going to have to remove you. I'm not going to negate the covenant with Levi, but I have to, it's kind of like, it's kind of like cancer. You got to go in and you got to cut it all out. You can't leave any trace of it. And this is kind of what God's doing here. He's cutting out, he's cutting it all out. So that he can continue with his covenant. And so, again, so that's, the, again, the first, that first part of the scripture there, where we see the priest and we see the covenant, and we see the covenant work, and we see his, God's passion towards that, because the, because the priests are breaking the covenant with him, and his anger, and his, and his righteous anger towards it. And in verse 10, it starts talking about this, another issue. And it says, verse 10, we, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? And he's basically just telling them, like, we were all created by God. We're all God's family. And he's about, and he's about to, again, bring up another issue with the people. And one that, again, if, when we understand God's covenant, you see, he, calls, he says, why do we deal so treacherously with one another? It's a treacherous thing of, of because of, again, because of how God views covenant, that he, co- he views it as an unbreakable thing. He, he, he views the people, the covenant that he made with the people, that they are to be his people, they are to be holy, they are to be set apart. They are to be his and his alone. That what they are, what they are doing, what they get into is a. It's a treacherous thing. And it says Judah has dealt treacherously, and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For for Judah has profaned the the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. So there's an abomination that has. But what I like what. I, want to stop real quick is the, the Lord's holy institution. And what he's talking about here is he's talking about marriage. And the first thing I want us to see is that marriage is an institution. But not the way that we hear about it today where, you know, we've all kind of heard and the, the, the argument, well, marriage is a man-made institution. Marriage is not a man-made institution. Marriage in this day and age is a very loosely man-managed institution, if you could even say that, or man-recorded institution. But it's not a man-made institution. Marriage began before the fall in the Garden of Eden. And, and, and again, to think about that, where God just finished creating everything. He created the heavens and the earth, the, the birds in the air, the beasts on the and the ground, the, the fish in the sea. He created everything, the stars in the sky. And after each time, he said it was good. This is good. I created it. This was good. He made man. And he said, this was good. And again, this is before the fall. Yet there was one thing out of all the creation. This is, again, this is God's perfect vision. God's perfect plan. Eden was, was creation and perfection. And there was something in this that before the fall of man that God said, it is not good. He said, it is not good that man should be alone. And so he created woman out of man. 
and married them to each other. And then he said, it is very good. Marriage is not a man-made institution. It's not a piece of paper. It's a God-made institution. And look what it says here. The Lord's holy institution, which he loves. God loves marriage. God loves what marriage does, what marriage represents. He loves marriage because it, 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 through a godly marriage, it promotes godly offspring. Through a godly marriage, one of the greatest things about marriage and, and why it's so important to it, and again, it is a covenant between a man and a woman, that it, and it's supposed to be an unbreakable covenant between man and woman. But one of the things we, that we see when we see marriage is we see that in everything, God created it to be a, a testimony of him and his people. Throughout all the scripture, oftentimes you see that, that a lot of the language that God uses, he uses marriage language when he talks about the church. He's the bridegroom. We are the bride. He is, he is setting, a self, setting the bride aside for himself. There is this language that God uses, and, and when you... When, with our marriage between a man and a woman, when it is God's marriage and when it is done God's way, it reflects that relationship that God has with people. It also, and it also, a lot of times, it reflects the gospel in very many ways. Because this be true for all the married couples here, right? If you want a, a, a good, successful, happy marriage, we have to learn how to die to ourselves, Right? Just like Christ gave up his life for the church. I got to give up myself for my wife. I got to put her needs above my needs. And, and if for it to be healthy, she needs to die to herself and, and put my needs above her needs. But when you have a, a husband and a wife and one of them is willing to do that and the other one's not willing to do that, you have a lot of discord and you have a lot of strife. But we see all throughout Scripture, our marriages, is, it, it's God and, and the covenant and, and, and the gospel working itself out and being that testimony to, to the world around us. A good, godly marriage is, is a beautiful sight. And again, is a great testimony to, to friends and family. I think about so many people here, even in this church, I know... The, the Dixons aren't here today, but I know they've been married for 40, I think almost 45 years. What was that? Are they next door? 45 years, roughly. And that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. Because you, you could talk to them and you know and you could see they still love each other. They, they, they give each other a hard time, but it's out of love and... and, and and all of that, and, and you can see the, 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 the closeness and the tightness of it, the unity of it, the faithfulness of it, the commitment of it. Jesse, how long have you guys been married? Jesse and Al. 34 years. I, and again, I, 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 we see in them, and I know again, Jesse always, she doesn't like it when I talk about them. But we can see in them God's love and God's grace working in their lives. Because Jesse's not perfect. Al's not perfect. Jesse's shaking her head very much. Yes, that Al's not perfect. <laughs> but we see as they both give themselves to God, how much God is glorified in that. And so we see here, God says it, it's an institution. It's something that he made. It's something that he created that is to not be broken. We can't say, again, it's like the covenant. Like the, we can't come and set our own standards for it, which is why in our day and age, in our culture, marriage is so much under attack because the world around us wants to come and set their own standards for it. They want to change they want to change the, the, the stipulations for it. 
And they convince themselves that they can because they just say, well, it's a, man it's a, it's a man-made institution. So if it's a man-made institution, it means that it doesn't really hold as much weight. But the reality is, is that God made institution. God established it. God created it. We don't get to decide on our own what qualifies a marriage. It's a man and a woman. Period. Not because I say so. Not because Dane says so or Dusty says so. But it's because God said so. And God loves it. He holds it in such a high regard. And so we see here, as we continue, it's a, his holy institution has been profaned. It's an abomination that has happened. It's an institution. It's a marriage which he loves. And he says here, he gives what that abomination is. The very next line it says, he has married the daughter of a foreign god. Verse 12 says, may the Lord cut off from the tents of Jacob a man who does this, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. Again, this is one of those things that kind of, it's God's word and it's God's truth. We come to it submissive to who he is. And the truth of, and the truth of it is, and I've known a lot of people where this has been an issue, the truth of it is, is it is never God's will for a believer to marry an unbeliever. And I've had friends and I've had people that I've known and, and things like that where they talk about, well, you don't know him he's, or her. She, they're, they're a good person. I, 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 maybe they'll, they'll, they'll come to the Lord, this and that. They, they make up all these excuses about, about rationalizing it. That I believe that this is who God wants for me. But if you're a believer... If your faith is in Christ and in Christ alone, it is never God's will for you to be married to an unbeliever. And it's not because they're a bad person, not because they can't know God, not because of anything like that, but because of, because of the strain that it puts. For all the married couples, marriage is hard, right? Even in a godly relationship, amen? Amen. There's not enough amens in here. I, I'll, I'll admit, I, amen. I know my, my first year of marriage, our first year of marriage was difficult. I had to get used to her idiosyncrasies. She had to get used to, she's still getting used to mine. But it's hard. And then you add in this aspect of a belief system and these different belief systems. And I think the that's the practical side of it, is that, that, that it, there's, a, there's that difficulty to it. But I think the key really to it is this, is in our lives, which relationship is more important? Is, God, is my relationship with God more important, or is my relationship with this other, this other person more important? And when I come to say, God, your, my relationship with you is the most important thing. Then I could say, okay, God, I don't believe this person is for me because they don't know and love you the way I know and love you. It's not because they're bad, but because we don't, we're not going to see eye to eye on that. But when we come and we say, Lord, I want this person, we're saying, Lord, this relationship is more important than my relationship with you. My desire for this person is stronger than my desire for you. And again, the key to this is being honest with ourselves. And hardly, and if we can be honest with ourselves in that point, in that situation, I would hope that we would make the right decision. But ultimately, again, that is what we're saying. And that is the key, is which relationship is the most important relationship? God's got to be the most important. 
God's got to sit here, and everything else has got to flow from it. Everything else has got to flow down from it. My relationship with my wife, which is, which is second to God, that is the next most important relationship with, that I have, is with my spouse and then my kids, and then work, and then however else that goes. But that's the way the, the priority should go. But God should always be first. And he says, again, he says, the severity of it says, may the Lord cut off the tents of Jacob, the man who does this, being awake and aware that he was aware of what's going on. He's doing it fully aware of what he's doing. And again, so, and yet he brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. And he's wondering why his offering isn't being accepted. He's wondering why his offering is being rejected. Because he's dishonoring God, but yet still trying to do his religious duties out of holding up, trying to look right or whatever, but he's still trying to do it all while living and and, and violating God's covenant and God's law. It was in God's law that they were not to marry foreign people, to bring those foreign gods into their households. Verse 13, it says, and so that was the first part, that first part of that. He brings two charges here, and it says, and this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. So again, he's continuing Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. And so what we see here is what was happening is that the the priests were not only marrying foreign gods, marrying daughters of foreign gods, marrying unbelievers, women, women that were worshiping another god, but they were divorcing their wife of youth to marry them as well. And again, so again, when we look at it through, the, through covenant eyes, through God's eyes of covenant, it's an abomination. It's treacherous. I mean, even, even to just the regular person, right? Just kind of regular person out there, doesn't know God, doesn't... If a man just l- married for 20 years, he's unsuccessful, or, 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 or he, he had nothing, she stayed with him, he becomes successful, all of a sudden he's successful and he divorces his wife and marries someone much younger. Even an everyday person knows, like, that's, that's kind of messed up. That's wrong. But it's, even in our day, it's common. It's commonplace. And this is what, the, and the Lord is saying, he's, he, he says, the, you cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, the crying of the, of the women that are just being divorced and being traded in. He says he doesn't regard your offering anymore. He doesn't hear you anymore. Peter talks about it, and in, in, in Peter, he talks about it. If you're at odds with your wife, I'm paraphrasing, you're at odds with your wife, that your prayers will be unheard. He doesn't regard the offering. He's got to go, you've got to reconcile. He says, he says here at the, at the end of verse 4, he says, she is your companion and she is your wife by covenant. So again, she is there. It is that unbreakable covenant. It's not somebody, this is not something we can just get rid of. We can just cancel when it's not convenient for us, when it's difficult, when, 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 when we're fighting and when we're, get, when we're not getting along. When we're going through a rough season in life and, and, you know, my wife keeps nagging me and I just like, dude, I'm tired of it. It's not an excuse to say, okay, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to get rid of her. It's a lifelong covenant. And he says in verse 15, it says, but did he not make them one? having a remnant of the Spirit. And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed in your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. He says they are one. What happens when we are married, what happened in the Garden of Eden, God said they became one flesh. 
And so to, so to divorce, it is to rip it apart, one flesh. And in verse 16 is kind of the, says, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce which makes sense. If he loves marriage, he hates divorce. And I know for many that that's a, that's sometimes, that can be a difficult thing to hear. I myself, I, my, my parents divorced when I was, I think, one. And I was blessed in that both my, my real dad and my stepdad were awesome men. They loved me, and they, my stepdad loved me as if I was his own, cared for me as if it was his own. My dad has always, has always been there. And, w- and whatever means it took, he would, you know, go through it to make sure that we could spend time together, that he, that, and he showed me his love. But often case, that's not the case. And again, when we look at this, this is, a, this is God's view of it, what God desires for it to look like. And while I fully believe that there is forgiveness, I also believe that God's desire and God's plan is always for repentance and restoration. And we live in a culture that marriage is, it's like a, it doesn't hold a lot of weight. We see movie stars who get, you know, movie stars and famous people who get married, married left and right. We have friends and family who get married left and right. And what they don't understand is that, again, because it is a God-made institution, when you get married, you're not, you're not only standing in front of your friends and family and, and committing to that other person, but you're standing before God himself. You're making a vow before God himself and saying, God, I am committing myself to this person forever. The, what are the vows? It's for sickness and health, for better or for worse, richer for poor till death do us part. They're not just pretty words. They're true words. They're, they're, it's the covenant that holds us together. And it's, the, and it's the words and the covenant which God holds us accountable. And so it's important for us to understand that, that, that one, that God loves marriage God will help us work in our marriage. He'll give us strength in our marriage. He'll give us patience in our marriage and peace in our marriage. And he'll help us through the hard times and he'll be there and he'll walk with us side by side. And what he hates and what he, what he desires to never happen is divorce because it breaks that covenant bond because it breaks what God sees as something unbreakable. You see it here in in this very next couple of verses. It says, For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. For the Jewish people, when, when, when they would get married, the husband would take his cloak and he would cover his wife with it as a sign of security and protection that he was providing for his wife. And when they were divorced, it was as if he was ripping that cloak in in half. He was covering it in violence. He was ripping apart what God had made one. And so the last two lines here says, therefore take heed in your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. And I think that's a good word for us just in everything. 
but especially when it comes to our marriages because, it, because they are so close, because they are so personal, because, that's, because at times with that person you are so vulnerable. Hurt happens, and sometimes that pain is, is difficult. But he says here, therefore, take heed in your spirit, not your emotions, not your logic, but take heed in your spirit. What is the spirit of God telling you? I'm going to close with this, last, this little story that, that, I, that I read. It was a lady who wrote in to Dear Abby, and she wrote in, and, and kind of paraphrasing, she was saying how how she was married before, and then when her marriage ended, she, she vowed that whenever she was gotten a mar- whenever she got, if she got married again, that she would, she refused to divorce, and that she would do whatever it took to make it work. But yet, she found herself in a place with her second husband that there was just a lot of hurt there. There was, there was a lack of love, a lack of kindness, and she just was miserable. And so she was writing Dear Abby about what can she do because she felt bound by the vow that she had made. And so, dear, and so you know, the, the writer, whoever, whoever the Dear Abby writer was, wrote back and you know, was trying to comfort her and trying to tell her, you know, God would want her to be happy. I don't think you need to be held by your vow. And in fact, found two other pastors or ministers, one a male, one a female, that twisted and turned scripture to try to tell her and try to rationalize it for her to, to say, you can get this out. God doesn't want this for you. He wants the good for you. He wants, the, he wants you to be happy. He wants you to be, you know, he wants it's okay for you to get out of the marriage. And that breaks my heart because, and you kind of see both sections of the scripture working out. It breaks my heart because you know that God loves marriage. He hates divorce. His word says so. His desire is for repentance and restoration. But yet here come the pastors. Here come the priests. Here come the ministers who are supposed to speak truth, speak knowledge, to tell her, hey, it's not going to be easy, but you need to trust in God. You need to rely upon God. Help to counsel her through it. But yet they take God's word and they twist it and they turn it to help her feel better, not do better, not be better, not honor God, but to feel better. And so again, if I can leave, leave you guys with two encouragements today. I didn't go that much, I didn't go that far over, so. I want to leave you guys, and kind of just those heart checks are, is, is, is God real to me? Do I live my life as if he was real? Do I live my life that I be, like as if I believe every ounce of it? Or do I live like I believe none of it? And the second one is for those that are married. Is does God rule and reign in my marriage? Have I given it to him? Do I honor him with it? Is he glorified with it? Is it a witness of who he is to the families and the people and the friends around me? And if we can be honest with ourselves, and if it is, and again, I pray that God gives us the courage and the strength to make whatever changes is necessary to reflect that. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you so much, God, for who you are. I thank you, Father, Lord, that you give us, you give us your word, Father. 
Father, and I also thank you, God, that your word isn't always easy. It's not always easy to hear, Lord, but it's always necessary. Lord, and I pray, Father, that you would give us humble hearts, God, to hear every time we open your word, Lord, that we would come to it humbly, Father. We would come to it, Father, with an open, an open heart, Lord, to hear what you would say, God. We come to it with a submissive heart, Lord. Ready, Father, to change ourselves to, to, to match your word. Not try to change your word to match what we need or what we want, Lord. Father, I thank you for every person here, Lord, every person watching, every person that will watch, Lord. I pray, God, Lord, that your spirit, Father, and that your, the Holy Spirit, Father, would just penetrate their hearts. I pray, God, Lord, that there would just be at least one thing, Father, Lord, that sticks with them and stays with them, and that you would continue to do your work, Father, lifting and carrying and picking each and every one of them up, Lord. Father, our hearts are yours. Our lives are yours. We submit everything to you and to your will, God. We love you in your precious name. Amen. All right, guys, we'll see you next week.